Hello boys and girls, thanks for joining with me again on this Advent week 3. This is day 3, chapter 3. And this chapter of Jotham's journey is called Friends. Jotham couldn't believe his eyes. He kept staring, expecting the sight to vanish, like the mirages he'd seen many times before in the desert. But every time he blinked, the image was still there. Camels. Hundreds of camels, it seemed. And not the mangy, broken-hooved kind he was used to. These camels were huge and strong and, and young. They stood proudly, their heads high in the air, gold-braided cords running from the bits in their mouths to the saddles between the humps. Then there were the people, two for every one camel, it seemed. All dressed in flowing robes of red and purple and blue, the men all wore turbans of white cloth, and the women had veils over their faces. The tents of these people were nothing like those of Jotham's father. Instead of goatskin, they were made of a funny cloth that shimmered in the sun and blew easily in the breeze. Each was made of many colors and came to a point high in the air. Then, high in the air, Jotham saw the strangest sight of all. A wooden frame covered in colorful cloth danced in the wind. It was held there by a string, and the string led down to the ground where it was held by a small boy. Jotham had never seen anything so magical and wondered for a moment if evil spirits were at work. Jotham stood staring at the scene, not believing that any caravan could be so rich or so beautiful. Was he actually going to be traveling with these people, he wondered? Nathan led Jotham down to the caravan. There he asked around until he finally found the man he was looking for. Salomar! Nathan shouted. The man turned and Jotham saw that he wore a huge turban with a red stone in the center. Nathan! Nathan, my friend! The two men met and hugged each other and kissed each other on their cheeks. Nathan, I am pleased to see you once again. But you have grown old, my friend. Nathan laughed. I am at least not so young as when we raided the Sultan's armory, he said. Jotham could hardly believe that Nathan knew such a rich man, or that he had ever done something so bold as to raid the armory of a Sultan. All Jotham ever knew was that Nathan read and copied scriptures of God all day. The two men all but ignored Jotham as they talked about former days. But Jotham didn't mind. He enjoyed watching the people and seeing all the riches that this caravan held. Finally, Nathan introduced Jotham, and Jotham bowed as he'd been taught. It is my honor to be in your presence, Jotham said politely. The older man smiled and bowed. Perhaps, Salomar said, I should have my son entertain the boy while we talk. That would be excellent, Nathan said, and Jotham nodded his head eagerly. Salomar called to the boy who was holding a string. He was about Jotham's age, and after handing the string to a servant, came running over, his green and black rope flowing behind him. Yes, father, the boy said. This is Jotham of Jericho. He's our guest. Treat him as such. That was all the instruction the boy needed. He bowed deeply to Jotham and said, May the sheep on a thousand hilltops grace your, flo your father's flocks, and may you find peace and joy among the tents of my father. Jotham returned the bow, and then the other boy introduced himself. I am Ishtar of Persia. It will be my honor to be your host on this most beautiful day. <clears throat> With the formalities or protocol taken care of, the two boys ran off among the tents and the camels, Ishtar leading the way. And even though they were in Jotham's own land near the town of his birth, Jotham knew that it was Ishtar's duty to act as host as long as they were in his father's camp. As they passed the servants still holding the string, Jotham threw his head back and stared up into the sky. What is that thing, he asked, pointing to the cloth that flew. Ishtar looked up. Oh, it's a kite, he said. It flies on the breath of the wind. The two boys wandered, wandered throughout the camp, but Jotham kept looking up at the kite in wonder and amazement. This is my uncle Jodpur's tent, Ishtar said, and Jotham gasped at the fine stitchery and the colorful designs on the walls of the tent. <clears throat> he comes from the house of Rajasthan. That meant nothing to Jotham, but he knew it would be impolite to say so. Smaller tents surrounded the large one of Ishtar's uncle. Jotham could see many women inside the tents and asked Ishtar about them. Those are my uncle's favorite wives. He left the rest at home. 
Jotham was shocked and amazed at this. He'd known men, some men, not many, who had two or three wives before, but never, never this many. Where is home? So Jotham asked. We come from Araman, where, and, and you are from Jericho, correct? Well, yes, that's where I was born, but my family are shepherds, and we live wherever the grazing is best, or wherever there's a market for sheep and wool. Where is your family now? Ishtar asked. And so Jotham told him. He told him about finding his father's camp deserted, though he didn't say why, and about finding his own grave. He told him how he'd picked, been picked up by another family of shepherds, and then how Decca of Megiddo tried to sell him into slavery, and about Nathan's daring rescue of him in En Gedi. He told about their flight to Qumran, and about Silas being killed here in Jericho, about Elizabeth and, Je and Zechariah, and how he, Jotham of Jericho, was going to be the cousin of the Messiah. Then he told of Nathan's second rescue, and how Caleb had killed most of Decca's men. When Jotham had finished telling it all, Ishtar sat cross-legged in the sand, with his head bowed. Jotham sat next to him and after several minutes said, Ishtar, is what's wrong? Ishtar spoke slowly without raising a head. I hang my head in shame for you, Jotham of Jericho. Jotham was shocked. But, but why? He asked, because many men were killed on my account? Ishtar sucked in his breath and slowly shook his head. No, he said. I am embarrassed for you because you have to make up stories to impress me. In my land, that is called Pazdadan, the building of a false image. But Jotham looked at Ishtar, anger rising inside him like hot lava. Ishtar, he said through his teeth, everything I have told you is the truth. Ishtar just shook his head slowly, refusing to look at Jotham, and finally Jotham pulled him to his feet and said, follow me. So Nathan and Salomar were sitting beside a fire drinking tea as Jotham and Ishtar approached. Ishtar's father frowned at the boy and said, Ishtar, why do you hang your head in shame? Ishtar fidgeted, not wanting to tell his friend. Ishtar, answer, his father commanded. Slowly, painfully, Ishtar said, My friend Jotham has made the pause to Dan. Ishtar's father looked from Jotham to Nathan and back. Then his son said, What did he tell you? And to his son, he said, what did he tell you? So Ishtar gave a brief summary, now trying to make it sound less preposterous, in order to keep Jotham's punishment to a minimum. And when he finished, Nathan began laughing and laughed so hard he fell on his side and knocked over the pitcher of tea. Ishtar, he said, wiping his eyes, everything Jotham told you is absolutely true. Ishtar's eyes grew wider than a grapefruit. But this cannot be, he said, slumping to the ground. My friend Jotham is no older than myself, and to have so many adventures. Ishtar looked at Jotham now like he was a holy man. Now it was Jotham who hung his head in shame. It's true, he said. That much has happened to me in the, in the last days. But all of this happened, Ishtar, because I did a bad thing. Nathan's friend Silas lives no more because of my disobedience. It was quiet for a moment, then Salomar said, it's a wise man who recognizes the fruits of his errors. It's a cash, compassionate man who regrets that fruit. You are truly becoming a man, Jotham of Jericho. Salomar's kind words felt like a soothing ointment on a burn to Jotham, and he smiled a little. Then Nathan said, Jotham, my friend Salomar and his caravan are headed west toward Jerusalem. He has agreed to take you as far as his course allows. Jotham smiled, now doubled in size. This time he was heading home for sure, and with Decca of Meg Megiddo dead, there was nothing that could stand in his way. Sometimes people feel like they have to make up stories about themselves so people might like them. Sometimes they feel they have to take the real things they do and brag about them. Sometimes people don't feel loved unless they are the center of attention. But Jesus came to earth exactly for the purpose of letting us know that every one of us is equally loved by God. It doesn't matter how many people think we're great. It doesn't matter how many great things we do. So instead of needing other people to tell us we're good and acceptable, all we have to do is listen to God's voice whispering in our hearts saying, I love you just the way you are. It doesn't matter what other people think. Jotham wasn't bragging when he told Ishtar of his adventures, but Ishtar was right when he said that telling tales and 
talking about yourself as building a false image. It means that you don't believe you're a very good person, so you have to try to convince others that you are. But there's a simple cure for feelings like that. The cure is only to worry about what God thinks of you, rather than what other people think of you. And on this Christmas Day, God said to you, I love you more than anything in the whole universe.